Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the London School of Economics for this evening's event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm uh, Charlie Bean, uh, Professor of Economics uh, here at the LSE. Uh, although previously I was Deputy Governor at the Bank of England, in which capacity I got to know uh, Andreas very well. Uh, Andreas began his career as a manager in Deutsche Bank, uh, moving in 1992 to J.P. Morgan. Uh, then in 2002, he was made co-head of Rothschild Germany. Uh, and in 2005, moved from there to Bank of America as vice chairman for Europe and head for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. But since May 2010, uh, so relatively uh, early on in the aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, he's been a member of the executive board of the, Do the Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, that's the equivalent of the Bank of England in Germany, uh, currently with responsibility for banking and financial supervision, uh, risk control, and the bank's representative offices abroad. Uh, in addition, he represents the Bundesbank at several international fora, including the G7 and G20, which is where uh, Andreas and I first got to know each other, uh, also the IMF, uh, the board of the single, single supervisory mechanism, the uh, supervisor for the uh, Eurozone, uh, and also the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Uh, he also holds an honorary professorship uh, at the European Business School uh, in Oesterich Winkel. Uh, his talk today will focus on the banking system seven years after the crisis. Uh, and while bankers and regulators are still busy implementing the lessons learned from the crisis, new challenges have arisen that may once again change the banking landscape. Uh, for those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag uh, for today's event is hash LSE banking. Uh, I'd also ask you please to put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event. Uh, this evening's event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast, assuming there aren't any unforeseen technical difficulties. Uh, and as usual, after the lecture, uh, there'll be a chance for you to put your own questions to Dr. Dombrett. Uh, but will you now uh, join me in welcoming to LSE to deliver his lecture tonight entitled, Shaken But Not Stirred, The Banking System Seven Years After the Crisis. And uh... Thank you very much, Charlie, and uh, um, thanks for all of you to come. And I very much include uh, Professor Goodhart in this, and uh, I have to say it's a big honor to be invited to Lon the London School of Economics. Um, it's my very first time here, and I'm already impressed, and uh, let's see how tough questions you can shoot on me uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, now, it's, uh, the Financial Markets Group Research Center is an outstanding research center, and uh, I've always been very, very impressed, and uh, uh, it's one of the leading European centers for academic research into financial markets. So uh, it's, uh, it's not only a pleasure, but it's uh, even more of an honor um, that, I'm, that, that I'm, I have the privilege of speaking here. Now, in my speech tonight, um, I'll outline the status quo in the banking sector, and I will speak about what I think the most uh, pressing challenges are. And uh, Charlie introduced me as the chief bank regulator in Germany, so I will, of course, focus on uh, bank regulation. Now, shaken but not stirred might be an accurate description of the present state of the banking system, which still represents many, many challenges. Now, in saying that, uh, I'm, as you probably noticed, I'm, of course, uh, alluding to one of your country's most successful exports. Um, uh, the agent, by the way, who not only uh, solved the Cold War single-handedly, <laughs> but who has recently also begun to prevent uh, wrongdoing on the financial markets, uh, and I'm referring, of course, to James Bond. In the 2006 version of Casino Royale, of probably all of you have watched it, 
uh, Bond's opponent, uh, you remember, um, uh, Le Chiffre, he engages in insider trading and market manipulation. Uh, in anticipation of his terrorist plot to destroy a prototype aeroplane, he bets on the fall in the stocks of the aircraft manufacturer. Moreover, he engages in extreme leveraging by financing the bet with money borrowed from African rebels whom he has promised high returns on the invested money. So he is engaging in the shadow banking sector, as we would say today, <laughs> and leveraging up. And of course, he's, it's, it is not the supervisory authority. In that case, it would have been the Bank of England. <laughs> but Her Majesty's agent, James Bond, uh, who prevents the attack, of course, resulting in the collapse of Le Chiffre's fraudulent plan. What else could you expect? Now, insider trading market manipulation, extreme leveraging, shadow banking, terrorism financing. Uh, you can also imagine how daunting a task like financial supervision is in the world without James Bond. Uh, seriously though, now besides the aspects I've just mentioned, there were even more problems, as Charlie knows very well, with banks and the financial markets before the financial crisis. Now seven years ago, uh, we were in the midst of a perfect storm unleashed by the financial crisis that had the Lehman Brothers insolvency at its focal point. Now, the events and revelations that followed put the global economy into recession, and I would add it actually discredited the banking sector quite a bit. Now, this led to an overwhelming demand to bring the state, bring the government back in for there was a demand for robust regulation of financial markets and of banks in particular, so that the financial sector would serve the real economy and the society, not the other way around. Now, I guess many, if not most observers back then, actually would have expected such a task to have been completed seven years later, to have been completed today. Nevertheless, I stand here today to convince you that we have not yet arrived at that completion point. Uh, rather, we actually need to continue the reconstruction of the banking sector. We need to finalize reforms with the aim of ensuring a stable banking sector that at the same time serves the real economy and achieves sustainable profitability in that exact order I may like to add. Now, this remains a broader challenge for society as a whole, uh, uh, one not only for banks, markets, and supervisors, but also for the general public, for academia, uh, and also for the media. Now, the financial crisis and the subsequent recession revealed to us why this is such an overwhelming um, challenge. The financial system and again, banks in particular provide an essential infrastructure function for modern economies. Their stable functioning is a public good. The negative externalities of actions taken by bankers and their banking institutions have profound repercussions for the entire system. Now, in my speech tonight, I will outline why work on this infrastructure is still in progress. If you think of the financial system as streets and bridges, the regulatory reforms around the Basel III package have led to some repairs, they have led to some renovations, and also to some closures. The infrastructure has become safer, but there are still quite a number of potholes and too many possibilities of a uh, localized collapse in the system. At present, we are still in the process of finalizing these reforms, of completing the reconstruction. Um, that is still very much needed. But first, uh, let me please uh, state uh, three truths that had to be learned the hard way during the crisis. And let me borrow the support of one of the leading academic figures in financial market research, as I'm here at the London School of Economics. About four months ago, I understand in this very room, correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie, Nobel laureate Robert Schiller presented the third edition of his book, Irrational Exuberance. Um, earlier editions of which had already pointed to the misguided policies of financial re-regulation in advance of the crisis, long before policymakers, markets, and the general public even became aware of them. His simple message this time was 
that irrational exuberance is still a defining feature of how financial markets work and function. Investors still follow cycles of mania and crashes, rather than rationally calculating the probabilities of all relevant scenarios, and rather than considering the negative externalities of their transactions. Full stop. This confirms the three truths or crucial lessons to be learned, realities to be accepted and remembered. First, people are, in the majority of instances, irrational. Rational calculation is severely limited internally by our, at least in my case, limited neuro neurological capacities and externally by uncertainty in a complex world. For supervisors, this implies that regulation cannot assume rational behavior, but interconnection and herding behavior. Negative externalities of market participants' decisions are still pervasive. Moreover, that's my second point, these human limitations are not mitigated by market structures. If anything, blind faith in unregulated markets has made a herding behavior worse. The markets are not self-regulating entities, but socially constructed institutions that do need publicly enforced rules. And the third truth is that banks, supervisors, and policymakers neglected these insights and failed in providing a stable financial system that serves the real economy. So when we discuss the consequences and further course of regulatory reform, we should always keep these simple but rather inconvenient truth in mind. Now what helps the purpose is to remember the costs of the crisis. Combining the direct costs of stabilizing the financial system with the cost of foregone production due to underutilized economic capacity, the global costs are rather huge and very significant. When we carry out cost-benefit analysis of the regulatory measures, we should remember the enormous amount of tax money spent on bank bailouts. Now, this experience and the fact that regulatory failure was one of the key causes of the financial crisis put pressure on policymakers and supervisors to revamp the regulatory framework. And the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the Financial Stability Board, which is led by the Governor of the Bank of England, and other standard-setting bodies have paved the way for this reform. I will come to some elements of this later, but most importantly, uh, the Basel Committee devised the Basel III framework with enhanced capital requirement rules, as you know, a leverage ratio, new liquidity regulations, new macroprudential instruments, and several further elements. Now, in the European Union, these rules have been translated into the capital requirements uh, regulation, the CRR, and the capital requirements directive four. Uh, moreover, in the euro area, we have created the Banking Union, which will have its first birthday on the 4th of November of this year with a single supervisory mechanism, Charlie mentioned it, and a single resolution mechanism coming into place and into force on the beginning of next year. And the reforms, and the reforms I would argue, have actually worked. They have played a considerable part in stabilizing the banking sector. Between 2008 and 2014, European banks have shrunk their balance sheets by 20% and have increased their capital ratios by five percentage points from less than 9% to around 14%, where well, the latter has been achieved through reduced volumes of risk-weighted assets as well as increases in own funds. As a result, most balance sheets have been reduced and refinancing has become more sustainable for banks. Now, against this backdrop and as memory of the crisis fades, some have begun to argue that further regulatory reforms are no longer necessary and that, they, that the reforms are choking the only recently restarted engine of growth. Stop any further action on regulation. But let me be very clear, all macroeconomic studies on the impact of regulatory reforms are consistent in stressing that the overall economic benefits far outweigh the cost. And that means that there is no way around fully implementing the reforms that have, that have already been initiated and that there's no way around finalizing the outstanding elements of the reform agenda.
Now, to summarize the current status quo, the banking sector's construction sites show that actually good progress has been made. The most important bridges have been renovated, rebuilt, or newly constructed. Yet, several projects still lie ahead before reconstruction is complete. And let's move to the, in my view, three biggest challenges facing the banking sector, at least the way I see them. Now, the first challenge is encapsulated by quite a technical term, namely multipolar regulation. Andrew Haldane, I hope I may uh, quote, uh, of the Bank of England has published an article on it which I found very interesting. Multipolarity refers to the new multiple regulatory requirements that actually bank, banks have to meet these days. Rather than having to meet just one capital ratio, they now will have to surpass several minimum requirements. Uh, there are first the improved risk-weighted capital ratio, second the, the new liquidity requirements have to be met, a short-term liquidity coverage ratio as well as a longer-term maturity mismatch ratio, and third the upcoming leverage ratio, fourth macroprudential buffers, and last but not least, besides better capital, also subordinated debt requirements. I actually could go on. This is a multiple effort, not a single regulatory effort. But the simple point is that a multipolar regulatory system is a reasonable approach to make banks safer and to make the system more stable. Multipolar regulation is a, what I would call, third way between overly complex measures on the one hand and very simple measures on the other. Both alternatives, overly complex and very simple, have actually failed in the past. The complex approach, in other words, Basel II, actually was tested in the crisis. Uh, the crisis and the rather poor performance of internal market risk models as a basis for calculating regulatory capital requirements have made sole reliance on such an approach, I would argue, impossible. And the simple approach, on the other hand, proved to not be entirely adequate either. Uh, the Basel I capital ratio of 1988, which was such a simple figure if you think about it, was rendered useless through regulatory arbitrage. Uh, therefore, the new framework combines the virtues of complex and simpler instruments in a multipolar system that overcomes several of the pre-crisis shortcomings. Now, which is why the Basel Committee, uh, and, and uh, Charlie mentioned that I'm a member of it, is currently in the process of finalizing the Basel III package. The new Basel framework, as agreed in 2010, uh, marked a milestone in the regulation of banks. No sooner had it been put in place than the Basel Committee set about tackling the, ver ver the variability of risk-weighted assets in portfolios with essentially similar risk profiles. And this variability makes it more difficult for investors to compare one bank with another. Uh, that is why the Basel Committee is currently overhauling the standardized approaches for credit, for market, and for operational risks. And the committee is also planning to introduce capital flaws for internal models based on the standardized approaches. And finally, we will improve the regulation of internal models so that risk sensitivity, simplicity, and comparability will be much enhanced. Another much needed change to the regulatory framework of banks is a revision of the privileged treatment of sovereign bonds, something which is very close to the height of the Bundesbank. This is another item currently on the agenda of the Basel Committee, as you may know, given the experience of the recent sovereign debt crisis in the euro area. Now, the Bundesbank is arguing for government bonds to be backed with a risk-appropriate amount of capital and for large exposure limits, just like those for claims on private debtors. Now, these reforms and the reforms that, I have already, that have already been finalized have led us into a world of multiple regulatory instruments. Now, some criticize this. Still, I believe it to be a reasonable approach because it keeps in check the complexity that is inherent in today's risk-based regulations. Each of the new instruments will capture and limit the risks from banks with differing business models and differing risk profiles. And the leverage ratio might not allow the detection of high-risk investment strategies, 
but that job will be performed using the risk-weighted approach. And the future floor will limit the problems that have emerged with internal models. For banks, risk regulation becomes an even more complex optimization problem. A bank's management has to integrate its business models with the multiple regulatory requirements. It, this implies a major challenge for operational processes, for risk management, and last but not least, for profit generation of banks. Now to sum up, the successful management and supervision of banks under multiple regulatory instruments, I believe, is a key challenge for bankers and for supervisors. And one, I may add, that needs to be combined with the challenge of rethinking a bank's strategy and rethinking a bank's business model. And I'll come back to that point uh, later because it's very important to me. Now, the second challenge I see opens up a previously untouched layer of the banking infrastructure of, for reconstruction, if we go back to our thinking of this in being in bridges and streets. As my colleague, uh, Andrew Bailey from the Bank of England has, I think, rightly criticized. The call for even higher capital provisions neglects that there are other ways to successfully protect financial stability. I refer to the rules that are designed to make banks resolvable without systemic disruption of the entire system. Such reconstruction is sometimes so delicate that we might think of it as an open heart surgery on the patient bank, so to say. Now, given the scale and sensitivity of this issue, the fact that the recovery and resolution regime has been globally agreed and will uh, soon be implemented across Europe, I think is an outstanding achievement. It was created to solve the problem of too big to fail banks and to protect taxpayers from having to bear the cost of a bank failure. This resolution regime is very important and a vital step forward in acting uh, on one of the key lessons learned from the financial crisis. The much discussed issue is moral hazard, a problem that arose because institutions that were pre previously too big to fail could not be held accountable for their actions. Now looking ahead, looking to the future, there won't just be recovery and resolution plans for credit institutions. Clearly defined liability cascades will be established also so as to ensure that the taxpayer really is last in line to foot the bill, that is to say after shareholders and after creditors have been bailed in and then only in absolutely exceptional circumstances and cases. But to put this theoretical resolution model into practice, institutions will need to hold a certain amount of additional debt, which, should the need arise, will be transformed into loss-absorbing capital. For global, systemically important banks, this will be achieved by a standard for total loss-absorbing capacity of banks, TLAC and Troit, which the G20 leaders will hopefully finalize at their summit in Antalya, actually in November, i.e. next month. The same principle applies to the European institutions by implementing, um, 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 by impl uh, but implementation here in Europe is based on what is known as the MREL standard, which differs in some respects from the TLAC requirement. One major and important difference is that the minimum requirements will be set individually for each institution by the competent resolution authority. And these new standards will have a transformative impact on the markets for loss-absorbing debt capital. Uh, again, it is done under the leadership of uh, Mark Carney. They will introduce new instruments and will enhance standardization of subordinated debt. In combination with new disclosure requirements, these standards will lead to transparent and to attractive investment opportunities, I am convinced. But at the same time, this will also lead to the pricing in of the increased probability of a bail-in. In other words, investors will demand higher risk premia. Uh, this brings me to my third challenge, namely adapting to new different market structures. What do I mean by that? Two things. Uh, first, market structures are going to be different than before the crisis, uh, especially, and in particular, they will be less liquid. And second, in such a new environment, banks need to adapt their strategies to survive. Without adaption, they will not survive. Now, while both trends will be monitored closely by supervisors, it is the banks and the market participants 
that have to adapt and that have to change. Let's think first about the market environment before I come to banks and uh, to their business models. Before the financial crisis, ever-present liquidity was the touchstone of the free financial market philosophy. The belief at the time was that if only demand and supply of a tradable asset were sufficiently high, you could assume perfect frictionless markets. But this actually turned out to be an illusion. Rather, the pre-crisis liquid market structure resulted in interconnectivity and the well-established problems of too big, too interconnected to fail and too many to fail. Moreover, this liquidity supported unsustainable trading strategies and it also supported short-termism. Now, in the post-crisis environment, in which tougher regulation is one element, as we all know, we have witnessed several new dynamics resulting from changing market structures. Particular attention has been paid to extreme, unexpected price movements that seem to have come actually from nowhere. The incident which received uh, the most attention was probably the so-called flash crash of 2010. Uh, on May 6 of 2010, investors were stunned, including myself, I have to say, when the Dow Jones uh, uh, plunged almost 6% before recovering, and all of that in 20 minutes. Uh, in light of such incidents, some have argued that post-crisis regulation has put pressure on banks to quit, to leave activities, which led to reduced liquidity, thereby increasing the likelihood of extreme price swings. I've heard this argument quite often. Now, this logic provides the basis for some people's demand for a redesign of regulation. Regulators are carefully now monitoring the micro and macro potential implications of the reforms. However, any analysis and recommendation would have to recognize that a reduction in the trading activity of banks was a genuine intention of the post-crisis reforms. We therefore need to weigh up concerns about liquidity against reduced trading activities. And to put it bluntly, yes, markets are going to be less conducive for the generation of quick profits, but that was what was intended by the reforms. Uh, what we very much need are informed and committed investors, not short-termism. And this will actually then strengthen stability. But that is also why banks need to adapt to the new environment, because there is a new environment. While the banking sector has been shaken, business models have not been stirred. That is, only few have been overhauled. Only few, few business models have been overhauled. Some stirring, however, might not hurt, and I would like to argue what I, why I think so. And here it is market forces rather than regulatory forces that come into play and that should come into play. What I mean is that banks must apply the asset test to their business models. Especially European banks are lagging behind in redirecting their strategies. Against the backdrop of changed market structures, in a low interest rate environment, which is in all likelihood here to stay, I have to say, in the Eurozone for sure, banks must urgently rethink their strategies to survive. I cannot emphasize enough how pressing it is for banks to assess and to adapt their business models. But let me also stress that it's not the task of supervisors to intervene in the strategic orientation of banks. The supervisors we have a public mandate to put a stop to imprudent activity with the aim of securing a stable banking sector that serves the real economy. Therefore, we tax and limit negative externalities. For example, in addition to what I've already discussed, legislation and regulation of banking structural reforms, also known as ring fencing, is underway in the United States, here in the UK, and in the European Union. The regulations will ring face those segments of banks that deserve particular uh, protection, in particular, of course, deposits. And this is designed to internalize negative externalities and reduce moral hazard. Banks will have to accept the new public framework and construct sustainable business strategies, which actually are compatible with it and which may uh, restructure their groups.
Now, in this regard, I fully understand the case for a large European investment bank as a response to the large U.S. institutions, as long as they are properly regulated and as long as they are not too big to fail, of course. Nevertheless, and almost needless to say, it is ultimately and exclusively the banks themselves that have to take these decisions. The role of universal banks and whether they should be broken up or not should be broken up should and needs to be decided by the owners, not by the supervisors. In terms of market-induced restructuring, supervisors prefer the banks to be stirred but not shaken. In that sense, living with new market structures and adapting business models to sustainable, for, to sustainable for profitability is the third vital challenge that the banking sector is now facing. Ladies and gentlemen, the crisis, I think, has taught at a number of important lessons. Humans, whether acting on financial markets or not, are not rational. Markets are not self-regulating and do need politically mandated regulations. And supervisors, market participants, and at least before the crisis, policymakers actually failed in providing a stable financial sector. Regulatory reform has already reversed some of the earlier mistakes, and these reforms have been highly beneficial for our economy and also, I would argue, for society. Completing these reforms will continue to be a demanding task for markets and for supervisors alike. But there is no viable alternative to completing these reforms. In Casino Royale, when asked if he wants his vodka martini shaken or stirred, Daniel Craig, alias James Bond, replies, I don't give a damn. Well, uh, actually, I do. The banking sector has been shaken by the financial crisis, but not stirred by the markets, at least not sufficiently. We cannot leave it um, solely to 007 to track down the bad guys. Bankers and regulators both still have to do a lot to finish the reconstruction of the banking sector. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my speech. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to a uh, good discussion. And for those who missed it, the new James Bond was released on Monday. <laughs>